Thank you, Chris, and good morning. It's a joy to be with you on this sunny Sunday morning with the uh, air has got a nice crisp coolness to it. Um, and to be in this text, this great passage of Scripture, John chapter 10, we're moving through it. We're in verse 22 this morning through verse 31. And the, uh, the temperature was cool when our Lord is uh, walking through the temple as we read in verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus is walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around Him and were saying to Him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us, Plainly, I want to stop and just make a comment here. I was uh, with a number of you in the adult class this morning. We were dealing with, and Mark was teaching Luke chapter 9. And there the question was put by the Lord, who do you say that I am? And who, who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? And they gave different answers. And Peter gave the right answer. You're the Christ of God. Well, now we have the the Jewish leaders putting the question to our Lord. Basically, who do you say that you are? Are you the Christ? Now, there's a great difference between those two passages because Peter answered out of faith and the others believed that too. And the Lord went on to say, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the leaders and killed and rise on the third day. Well, here we have the leaders asking that question, but they're not asking it out of faith. They have rejected him. The Lord knows that, as we see in a moment. And they are asking for a pretext to put him to death. What a difference. Mark made the point that this, the way one answers that question is crucial. It, 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 the, the, those who believe have eternal life. Those who don't have the opposite, have death. And uh, what we see here is the determining factor in all of that ultimately is the Lord's sovereign grace. So they ask the question and they say, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Well, right there, he's given them the answer. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And here we see the real heart of these men. In verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Bless our time of studying it together. May it be a rich, enjoyable sanctifying time. Let's pray. Lord, I like that line, justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. That's the reason he holds us fast. And we certainly have that assurance in our text this morning. Well, we come in our studies of John's gospel to one of the great text of Scripture and one that one Christian writer called one of the grandest thoughts in the Bible. It's the subject of eternal life. It's not the first time Jesus has talked about eternal life in John chapter 3, verse 16. It is the promise given to all of those who believe in Him. Those who believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's unending life. And life that can never 
be lost by us. That's indicated in the term itself. It is eternal, not temporal. But that great truth is explained more fully in this passage when Jesus said, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. Never means never. That is one of the grandest thoughts. A believer in Jesus Christ is absolutely secure now and forever. That fact is the, the basis of our assurance as Christians. It's a very important doctrine to understand. And without that, I think our spiritual growth is stunted. Without that, it's very difficult to advance in the Christian faith. And uh, this eternal life that he speaks of here is free. It's given to us by Christ. It's given. It's a gift. It is not inherited. It isn't earned. It isn't in any way something that, that we, we deserve. It is a free gift bought for us by Christ and received by us through faith and faith alone. Now that's the promise and the lesson that the Lord gave one day when he was in the temple. It happened in winter time. That's how the passage begins in verse 22. The Lord was in Jerusalem. It was the time of the Feast of Dedication, which is Hanukkah. Hanukkah is Hebrew for dedication. It celebrates the cleansing of the temple after the Assyrian king Antiochus Epiphanes set up, a statue in the sanctu uh, set up a statue of Zeus in the sanctuary and sacrificed a pig on the altar. He had conquered Jerusalem in 167 B.C. and he wanted to Hellenize the country and the people, turn them into Greeks. The Jews revolted under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus, Judah the Hammer. They defeated Antiochus, recaptured the temple, and rededicated it to God on December 14th, 164 B.C. The Jewish celebrated for eight days. From that time on, the Jewish people have celebrated the deliverance during the month of December. By the time of our Lord, that was the last great deliverance the Jews had known. And it became, in the minds of many, a symbol of the hope that God would again deliver His people. Josephus gave an account of the institution of Hanukkah, in which he said it came to be known as the Festival of Lights, because it symbolized hope. Today, of course, the Jewish people celebrated by lighting a, a candle on each of the eight days. Now, John tells us that Jesus was in Jerusalem and walking in the temple at that time. During the Feast of the Dedication, it, it was no accident that, that he was there then. During the Festival of Lights, the the, uh, the light of the world was walking in his father's house. As I say, that was no coincidence. And at that time, when the, the hope of deliverance was on the minds of the people, the Lord offered the people deliverance. He promised to give eternal life to his sheep, to those who follow him. He'd recently called himself the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep. But the Jews wanted to know more. They wanted to know if he was the Messiah. It was winter, John tells us, mid-December, when they found him walking in the portico of Solomon. Now that may be nothing more than a, a time note for the benefit of Gentiles who were reading this and weren't familiar with the time of the Feast of Dedication but then it may be something more than that. It may be something like Shakespeare's 
opening line of Richard III, now is the winter of our discontent. Richard wasn't talking about the weather. He was talking about his family's troubles. And John was describing more than the, the season of the year. It, it was not only at the time of cold weather, it was a time of winter in the hearts of God's people. It was a time of winter in the relationship between the Lord and the Jewish people. Their hearts were cold. And they, and they circled, when they circled Jesus and asked him to end the suspense and tell them plainly if he were Christ, if he were the Messiah, they weren't asking a friendly question. It was hostile. The Lord knew their hearts. He knew, he knew their intentions. He knew that they had no real interest in the truth at all, that, that if he spoke plainly as they were asking him to do, they would not believe because they weren't believing in him. So he answered that he had told them this he gave them many indications of this, and they hadn't believed. The works that I do in my Father's name, he said, these testify of me. In other words, everything that, that he had said and done, much of which they'd witnessed, much of which they'd heard, all of that without even declaring explicitly, I am the Christ, was ample evidence of who he was, ample evidence that he was the Messiah. They'd already seen and heard all that they needed in order to believe. But in spite of all the miracles that had taken place, all of the healings that he had done, and all of the clear instruction that he had given, you remember from chapter 7 when the temple police come back to the Sanhedrin having been sent out to arrest him, and they come back empty-handed, and the priests ask him, where is he? They said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. We've never heard teaching like this. And these priests had not either, and yet they had not believed. All of that, and they had not believed. The Lord then explains the reason for their unbelief. He explains it in verse 26. They did not belong to his flock. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Earlier in verse 14, he said that the sheep, his sheep, know him. In verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Hearing is important. Later, for example, at the empty tomb in chapter 20, Mary Magdalene saw Jesus standing behind him as she turned and when she saw him, she thought she was looking at the gardener. She's looking right at him, but she doesn't recognize him. It, it wasn't until she heard him say her name that she recognized him. And then in the next chapter, in chapter 21, when Simon Peter is out on the Sea of Galilee fishing, and they're close to the shore, and they see him on the shore, he didn't recognize him, but when he heard that it was the Lord, he knew it was. He knew who he was. Hearing is emphasized here in this text, in all of the Gospel of John, in all of the Scriptures, all of the Bible. Paul wrote, for example, in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Supernatural. We have ears to hear by grace. And we understand the meaning of Scripture by grace. But that comes through Scripture. We need to study the Word of God. We need to listen to it because we hear the Lord's voice in it. It is the Lord's voice. And as we hear it, it changes us. Oh, these men didn't hear. These men didn't know Him. They didn't hear him or follow him because, as he explains, they're not his sheep. The, the word order here is very important. 
It's something that perhaps we can just skim over in our minds, but the word order is very important. You'll notice the Lord didn't say, you are not my sheep because you do not believe, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Later, it says in verse 29, his sheep are those whom his Father has given to him. He did not give these men to him. Therefore, they were not able to hear and believe. They wanted straight talk from the Lord, and and He speaks very plainly to them. More plainly than they wanted to hear, perhaps more plainly than many Christians want to hear. And He speaks very clearly to us in these words, with words that tell us of our complete dependence on the Lord for all that we are and have. In themselves, men and women are unable to come to Christ. Men and women are unable to believe. Those who believe do so only because God acts in grace to elect them and give them to Christ. Now, we're halfway through the Gospel of John, and I hope you've noticed as we've been going through this great fourth Gospel that... You just can't get away from sovereign grace. And why would you want to? What's more encouraging than that? The Bible is all about God's free gift to people. Free gift to mankind. Only He can save. Only He can thaw a cold heart and bring warmth in summer to life that is spiritually dead. And these men were. They were spiritually dead. Now that doesn't excuse anyone of their responsibility to believe. The Bible never does that. It affirms human responsibility. It affirms it as much as it affirms affirms divine sovereignty. We are all responsible for the things we choose to do and think and believe. And the Lord had given clear and overwhelming evidence of who He is. The evidence for Him, I say, is overwhelming. The invitation to come to Him, to believe in Him, is freely offered to all. And and all who desire to come may come. He holds no one back. This notion, perhaps, that people might have that, well, I, I, there are people out there, they really want to come, but the Lord said, no, no, you, you can't come. That's not the case at all. All who desire to come may come. He holds no one back. And those who do come by His grace come willingly and gladly because they see their great need, great need of the Savior, and they respond to Him. So they follow, and that statement, that description of following is in the present tense. It means they continually follow in faith. Their faith continues. They persevere in that faith and and the obedience that comes from faith. Back in Luke chapter 9, where the Lord says, Who do men say that I am? And Peter confesses that he is the Christ of God. Jesus speaks of those who come after him, those who believe. They they deny themselves, they take up their cross, and they follow him. And that's what we do. We realize I'm not sufficient. They deny themselves. It's not perfect. And we struggle with that, and, and, and we grow in denying ourselves and in following him. But that's what we do. And, and uh, it, it is a consistent thing. It is in the present tense, as I said here. It characterizes the, the sheep, the Lord's people. But they follow because they see it and they receive it only by sovereign grace. That response of following is the product of God's work within them. It is all a gift 
The Lord says that plainly in the next verse. It's all a gift, and those who receive it are never disappointed. How could they be? He promised to give his sheep eternal life. What, what greater gift can anyone receive than that? He gives life without end. But not just life, it is the life that was lost through sin. The greatest possession that one could have, that Adam possessed and lost through sin. So it's spiritual life like God's life. It comes from Him, and it is a present blessing. At the moment of faith in Christ, we become new creatures. We have new hearts. We have new natures. We, we have a new relationship with God. We know God. And later, Jesus defines in chapter 17, verse 3, eternal life as knowing God and Christ, knowing Him, knowing the triune God. And so what a privilege. I uh, had some picture on my computer screen that came up of uh, the picture taken by the James Webb satellite, uh, a camera that's out there that goes into deep space and we're seeing things we've never seen before. And on this, this screen, there's all these disks of light out there, hundreds of them. I didn't count them up, but uh, hundreds of them. They're, they're galaxies, and that's just a sliver of the universe that we're looking at. And I thought, I've got it on my screen, and, and, and it's all there to just to look at. But the, the reality, it's vast, vast. These are not just our galaxy, but beyond it and other galaxies, this vast universe, and yet... To the Lord God, it's just a little speck. It says nothing to Him. That's the Lord God, and we know Him. We have a relationship with Him. We're joined to His Son. We're joined to the triune God. We have peace with Him. Justice has been satisfied, as the song put it. We're forgiven by Him we're adopted into His family so that we have all of the rights and privileges of the sons of God. We know God and we have power. It is life that, that gives power to enable us to live a life of obedience, uh, to resist and overcome the sinful desires that are still there that we struggle with. So it is a powerful life, it is a pure life, it is a holy life, a clean life. Well, that's the gift that God gives, and there's no greater gift than that. And it goes on forever. That's the real emphasis here. It is eternal. It does not end ever. And they will never perish, he says. In the Greek text, it is stated as a double negative to put emphasis on the point. It can be translated, they shall by no means ever perish. That is security. What's sometimes referred to as eternal security. And often described in this simple phrase, once saved, always saved. Again, it's what Edwin Palmer called one of the grandest thoughts in the Bible. I, I agree with that. What, what can be more, what can give more comfort and encouragement than to know that we are always secure? That Christ has settled the issues of sin and judgment once and for all. We have eternal life, meaning we have eternal security, and we have it at the moment of faith. That is a grand thought. And it, it's a great tragedy when people don't believe it. And I'm speaking of Christian people. Uh, they, they live as a result of that frustrated and stunted lives from the fear of losing their salvation, wondering if they truly are saved, knowing that they believe, but are they still believing and struggling with that? 
I think we all go through that to some degree. But it, it, it leads to frustration in the Christian life. Well, the idea of losing the salvation that we have obtained through faith in Christ is completely impossible. The simplest proof for eternal security is in the very words our, uh, of our Lord. What's He call it? He calls it eternal life. It's eternal, not temporal. It is not life for a year, it's not life for ten years, it's not life for a hundred years, but life forever. And if words mean anything, then, then these words mean that the life He gives to the believer is life without end. But if that's not enough, the Lord piles up the proof and assurance with the next words. He calls His gift eternal life and promises that none will perish. Then He says, no one will snatch them out of My hand. Who won't snatch them out of His hand? No one. Can it be any any more comprehensive and absolute than that. The devil can't snatch the believer from Christ's hand. Bad teachers and bad friends can't do that. You can't even snatch yourself from the hand of our Lord. And we can't accidentally slip through His fingers. Now that truly is one of the grandest thoughts in the Bible, especially when we find ourselves helpless, as many believers have, and some of us likely will. Alzheimer's has been called the scourge of the century. The first person diagnosed with it in 1901 told Dr. Alzheimer, I have lost myself. That's scary. It happens to Christians. We're not exempt from that or dementia. We're not exempt from any of the problems of life. But when that happens, a person is no longer able to, to be self-aware, to know who they are. No longer to, able to believe, understand the things that they have believed and the hope that they have. They have lost themselves. But the good news is, we can never lose our salvation. And, and why is that? Because the Lord cannot lose us. It's an impossibility. We are in His hand. His hand is not weak. In the Bible, the hand is the, the place of power. It's the place of care. And Christ's hand was, was always that. Whenever He stretched out His hand... He did so with power and for blessing. He placed His hand on the sick. He touched lepers. He touched the eyes of the blind, and He healed them all. He touched the, the son of the widow of Nain and restored his, his life. That's, that's the hand of our Lord. It is life-giving. It is a human hand because He became a man, but it is a human hand with divine power in it because He's the eternal Son of God. And it's secure. It's fail-safe. Nothing can overcome it or frustrate it. It is impossible to slip from the Lord's hand or be snatched out of it. But to make that impossibility absolutely clear, the Lord adds another statement in verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father is omnipotent. The Father is all-powerful. He is bigger and stronger than all of the creation. The entire universe. He is bigger and stronger than all of the people of this world and all the devils that fill the, 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 the air put together. Isaiah has a magnificent description of, of the Lord 
in chapter 40, and there he sees him sitting on his throne uh, with the, the, the earth as the footstool of his feet, and he says, all of the inhabitants of the earth, and we can include all the inhabitants of the air, the demonic realm, and all of that. He says, it's like, they're like grasshoppers below him. There's nothing. They are as nothing. And so to be placed in the hand of Christ which is in the hand of the, of the Father. Christ, we're in Christ's hand, and He's in the Father's hand. That gives us, I think it was Dr. Johnson I first said this, gives us double security. Being in the hand of Christ is sufficient, but we're not only in His hand, we're in the Father's hand as well. That, that, that makes for the greatest spiritual fortress in the universe. Nothing can shake it. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't be shaken and that, that, that we can't suffer loss. We can and we do. We are tempted daily, moment by moment in this life, and we stumble and we fail frequently. Following Him doesn't mean we don't stumble as we follow Him. We do, frequently. Someone has likened our progress through this world to that of a boy climbing a snowy hill. He frequently slips, but he does manage to get to the top. And I read that and I thought, well, I can relate to that because I had a lot of experiences like that as a boy growing up in Kansas City. Every year it snows, and each year I'd bundle up and get my red arrow sled and climb the highest hill and go down. I see Phil smiling back there because he grew up in Kansas City too. But, but frequently on, on the way up, I'd lose my footing, I'd slip, and I usually slip down a ways before getting back up on my feet and getting to the top of the hill. And that's the Christian life. It's full of slips and setbacks. But we keep going forward, and while we fall in the Lord's hand... We never fall out of the Lord's hand. We are secure. Howard Pryor, one of uh, the late fathers of this church, told me a story from his own experience that I've never forgotten. And I uh, think it illustrates what the Lord is teaching here. Mr. Pryor was, as some of you may know, a graduate of the Naval Academy and told me that after Japan surrendered in the Second World War, his ship docked in Tokyo Bay. And one day the crew was given shore leave, and they went to Yokohama, which was the industrial section of Tokyo. It was in ruins, complete ruins. The whole Tokyo area had been firebombed repeatedly during the war. And toward the end of the war, the B-29s were flying over the country and they flew so high that the Japanese could not defend themselves against it and they suffered this constant bombing. And there in Yokohama, all the buildings and all the buildings that whole area were just reduced to rubble. They were pulverized. And he said the only things they saw left standing in the ashes and rubble were the iron vaults where the banks once stood. The banks were gone, but the vaults were there. They withstood the pounding. Well, the hand of God is like an iron vault, and that's really uh, not saying enough. Nothing, though, can destroy or overcome it. In it, we are absolutely secure. Everything in this world can give way. We can suffer the loss of things. We can suffer difficulties. Times may come that take our health, take our savings, our friends, even our lives. But our souls are absolutely secure. So the saints persevere. The saints stay steadfast in their faith. But the reason we persevere, the reason for the perseverance of the saints 
is the perseverance of God with the saints. He never lets us go. Charles Spurgeon illustrated that this way. He, he pointed out that every believer is a member of Christ. He is our head, we are His body. Some of us are an eye, some of us are a toe. We have different places within this body, different responsibilities, but we're all part of His body. And then he asked, will Christ lose His members? How could Christ be perfect if He lost even His little finger? Are Christ's members not are Christ members to rot off or to be cut off? Impossible, he says. If you have faith in Christ, you are a partaker of Christ's life and cannot perish. If men were to drown me, he writes, they could not drown my foot as long as my head is above water. And as long as our head is above water, up yonder in the eternal sunshine, the least limb of his body can never be destroyed. He that believeth in Jesus is united to him, and he must live because Jesus lives. And he always lives. And as the author of Hebrews writes, he always lives to make intercession for his people. He always prays for us. He's praying for you at this very moment. And he prays that we persevere. He knows the difficulties. He knows what you go through. He went through it himself far greater than you did or will. He knows where we are. He knows what we suffer. He knows how to pray for us. And he prays that we will continue faithfully. And we will. Why? Because of us? No. Because of him. Because of who he is. And what he's done. And because his prayers cannot fail. We do not have a Savior who, who casts His people away. We don't have a, a God who leaves His children to perish. He promises to keep us always. Time will run out on this world, but not on us. The millennium will come and pass into the new heavens and new earth. Eternity will roll on forever and ever. And we will never perish, but only increase in the glory and the joy of eternal life. That is the promise of Christ. And He cannot fail to keep His promise. Because of who He is. And He reveals that in verse 30. Are you the Christ, they're asking? He says, I and the Father are one. British scholar F.F. F. Bruce called this a shattering statement. It was certainly a stunning revelation to those around him because it was, in fact, a declaration of deity. He's already equated his hand with the Father's hand, he has said, in effect, that he is equal with him in power as well as in purpose. And so the word one is the oneness of essence, expressing the unity of the Godhead while preserving the, the separate individual, individuality of the two persons of the Godhead, two of the three. In other words, he, he was not saying that he is the Father, but that he is united with the Father. That word one is actually neuter in the Greek text, and it means one thing. The idea is they are of the same essence in deity and equal in power and glory, but they are distinct as persons. So there is unity between God the Father and God the Son, but not confusion. God is a trinity. There's one God who subsists or exists in three persons. That is, the, that is stressed throughout this, this fourth gospel. It's the, in the first verse of, of the prologue, the first verse of the book. We read Christ being, of Christ being the Word who was in the beginning, was with God and was God. 
isn't God the Father, but is God the same essence as the Father. At the end, in chapter 20, Thomas, doubting Thomas, comes to see the Lord, and he confesses that he is Lord and God. Here Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now that's the answer to the Jews' question. He is Christ, and he is God. They was, he was telling them more than they were asking for. But he became one of us. This is the amazing thing. He became one of us when he left the glory and the joy of heaven, took to himself human nature, was born of a virgin, the creator of all things, became a creature. That is amazing. And yet, it was only in that way that we could be saved from our sins if someone as great as that, infinitely great and absolutely perfect, would come and represent us in judgment. Christ only could do that. And he came to the temple on Hanukkah when the Jewish nation had the hope of, of deliverance on its mind and he spoke of being the deliverer. He is the one who saves. He turns winter into spring, brings death, brings those in death out into life. He gives eternal life and he gives it freely. He can do that because he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. What do we do in all of this? The only thing a person can do to have a gift. Receive it. Simply receive it. Jesus speaks of his sheep hearing his voice and following him. That's a way of saying they believe in Him. That's all that a person must do to be saved. Simply trust in Christ. It's all that a person can do. And we can only do that by the sovereign grace of God. But doing that, you will have the great gift, the gift of eternal life. Well, as I've said, I say again, that is sovereign grace. But people don't like to hear that. They respond angrily against it. They did hear the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. What about you? If there's anyone here who's not believed in Christ, listen for his voice. Centuries ago, the hospice of St. Bernard was founded in the Swiss Alps in order to help pilgrims and travelers on their way. At the top of the hospice was a bell. And when, when storms came and, and the snow was falling, the monks would ring that great bell so that when the way could not be seen, travelers could hear the way to the house of refuge. If you're here this morning without Christ and you hear the sound of His voice, come to Him. Come to the refuge that we have in Him. Find refuge in Him. His sheep hear His voice and they follow. May God help you to do that and receive the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. And you who have it and can never lose it, rejoice. Well, let's rejoice in that. By standing and singing hymn number 25 in the Songs of Praise book before the throne of God above and remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 25. Father, that's a great truth. One with Him, we can't die. Not spiritually, even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death and death does touch us, for the believer it's like a shadow. Death, a shadow can't hurt. And our death is only the means of entering into your presence. 
We have nothing to fear from death. We have nothing to fear before death. Our life is secure in Christ. Help us to understand that. You'll never cast us off. We'll never die spiritually. We have eternal life. And it's now, it's a present blessing. You're with us. You're guiding us. You're taking care of us through the storms of life. And we will enter into glory someday. And what a day that will be. All because of your grace. Help us to understand that better. And live joyfully in light of it. We thank you for Christ and all that we have in him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.